Okay. We're going to go ahead and get, get started, everyone. Thank you to all of our 46 uh, participants who are on the line right now. As, uh, this is the Becoming a Faculty Member at a Primarily Undergraduate Institution webinar that is brought to you by the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. I am Erica Sabrassi. Um, I am the Society's Education and Professional Development Manager. And the ASCMB offers a whole slew of career resources for grad students and postdocs, including this webinar series. So you saw that we have two other webinars scheduled later this year, one in April and one in May. We'll also be adding additional webinars each month through the remainder of the year. So I would encourage you to check back to that webinar website regularly and see all the different offerings we'll have. Um, for example, we're going to have one on resumes and cover letters here coming up probably in June. So I want to go ahead and introduce you to our panelists today. Margaret Carroll, who, you, who is not able to share her webcam, uh, but she is with us on the line. Margaret is a professor of biology at Medgar Evers College, which is part of the City University of New York system. Margaret earned her PhD in cell biology from St. John's University and is a member of the ASCMB Education and Professional Development Committee. Uh, Tamara Manns, who is on the webcam, uh, webcam, she is a biology professor at North Tennyson Community College in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And Tam earned her PhD in molecular biology at Simpson. Christopher Meyer, who is also on the webcam. Chris, can you wait for us? Uh, Chris is a program director in the Directorate for Biological Sciences at the National Science Foundation. He also is a professor of biochemistry at California State University, Fullerton. Chris earned his PhD in biochemistry at the University of California, Riverside, and is a member of the ASCMB Minority Affairs Committee. Uh, Joe Provost, who is also on the webcam, is a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of San Diego. He earned his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Joe is also a member of the ASCMB Education and Professional Development Committee. And then last but not least, Andre Wallace, who is on the phone but is not able to share his webcam. Uh, Andre is an assistant professor of biological sciences and genetics at Fairleigh Dickinson University in Teaneck, New Jersey. Did I say that right, Andre? Yes, you are. Fairly Dickinson University. Great. Uh, Andre earned his PhD at Pennsylvania State University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship through the ARACTA program, which is Institutional Research and Academic Career Development Award Program. So we're going to kick off this webinar uh, with I, I'd like to give two minutes to each of our webinar panelists. So in two minutes or less, can you tell our participants about a typical day for you? And you're welcome to include any personal or career, career details you feel will be helpful to the participants. So I'm going to start with Margaret and give her her two minutes to answer. Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Margaret Carroll, and I work at a college called Medgar Evers College, as was said before, part of City University of New York. So we're an urban public commuting college. I have about 7,000 students. I'm in the biology department, which is actually one of the biggest departments um, in the college. Uh, my typical day, since we're a um, primarily undergraduate institution, my typical day does involve a, a moderate teaching load. We teach about four classes in the fall and three classes in the spring. That is what our requirement is. Those classes could be three-hour lectures or three-hour labs. Uh, one thing that's nice about our college is that uh, we're a comprehensive college. We offer both associate degree and uh, baccalaureate degrees, uh, and we have small classes. So pretty much the class size is between 25 and 40 students. This gives us an opportunity to have maximum interaction with the students, to know their names, um, and build a relationship with them. We're heavily student-centered. Uh, we do a lot of academic mentoring of the students. We pretty much have an open door policy. Students pretty much can come to the department and come come into the faculties and interrupt us, and we're usually willing to uh, to speak with them and give them academic advice, professional advice, um, tell them who they should go to speak to if it's something that we can to answer. 
we also do a lot of um, undergraduate research training with the students, so it's not just uh, academic mentoring. We do a lot of um, research training. So we work with them in the labs and, and teach them how to do research and, and hopefully get a project going and get abstracts at the end of maybe a semester at the end of the summer. And then uh, we uh, take students to uh, local conferences and professional conferences where they have the opportunity to present their research. Um, my day is full of usually teaching and committee work. Uh, there's always meetings. Okay, I'm on numerous committees, um, important committees, small little committees, department committees, CUNY committees. So that pretty much um, occupies a lot of my day as well as uh, teaching and interacting with the students. So I house that for two minutes. <laughs> and maybe That's great. Some chance, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're under. Uh, Tam, if you'd like to go next. Sure, yeah. I'm Tam Manns, and I work at a community college. Um, I teach about twice as much as that um, time-wise. We do 21 hours per semester, so I have usually seven classes in the fall and seven in the spring. And they're uh, uh, usually mm, probably two lectures and about five labs. Um, our lectures can range. We go up to 120 because that's how many fit in the room. Um, and in a lab, it's restricted to 24 because of uh, safety numbers. Um, the majority of my students are underrepresented students, and the majority are first generation also. So um, it's an open access institution, which means that you are required to have gone to high school and have a, a diploma or a GED. And that's it. That's the only requirement. Um, so our students are um, across the broad spectrum of backgrounds and abilities. Um, so when you're teaching, you could be um, you're just hitting a lot of, of differences among the students. Um, the majority of my classes are for students who are intending to go into nursing or health majors. So I teach introductory bio um, to them. I also do teach some people who are planning to major in biology. So again, introductory bio one, two, and genetics for those folks. Um, we often co-teach. We do shared labs and lectures. Um, like one of us will be doing the lab for someone else's lecture group. Um, we do do a fair amount of um, sort of coaching and mentoring of the students because of them being first generation. They often don't have anyone in their family or friend group to give them good advice. So that's one of the things that we try to um, just get out there in front and teach them those, those things that maybe nobody else is advising them about. Um, we also do a little bit of research with the students, but the time is pretty limited. Um, it's one of those things that everyone would like to happen, but it's, it's difficult to fit it in. So you try to do what you can. Um, but many times we try to do the research in the context of the classroom. So. Great. And it looks like Andre has joined the webcam successfully. So uh, kudos to Andre. He has, he has a lot of issues that were not his fault. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let Chris answer next since he's, he's next on my list. Okay. Well, happy to. So I'm, I'm actually will tell you what a typical, I'll sort of back cast a bit because I'll talk about a typical day when I was uh, on the faculty at Cal State Fullerton. Um, my day here at NSF is always busy and exciting with, uh, with a lot of things going with a, with a look to serve the community. And I will say that, uh, you know, PUIs, uh, supporting PUIs and supporting, you know, the integration of research and teaching is a major mission of uh, the National Science Foundation. And the funding rate for PUIs is pretty much is, is, is on par with uh, R1 institutions. Um, one of the differences is that we'd like to see more um, proposals coming from PUIs. I know there's rate limiting steps in doing that. Uh, and uh, also um, get engaged more with uh, NSF service. This is service for your profession and not maybe as much, and, you know, as, as part of your portfolio of service. To serve as a reviewer or panelist is a great experience. But anyway, um, back to my life at, um, so the NSF infomercial ends for a moment. Chris, sorry. Chris, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're having a really hard time hearing you. You might want to okay. get closer to the phone. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me better now? That's much better, yes. Okay. Much better. For that, I was doing a, a bit of what I call the NSF infomercial, which I, I do <laughs> think is important, and that is there's a lot of support here across the directorates, uh, foundation-wide, for primarily undergraduate institutions. And so we're always looking for good uh, proposals uh, via the RUI mechanism, research at undergraduate institutions. 
And, uh, you know, one of the myths is that no one gets hired from undergrad universities, and that's not true. The, the success rates are comparable. One of the differences is um, that there are fewer submissions, and there's a proposal, right? And we can maybe talk about that later. Also, I think um, the thinking of, of service to the profession, uh, where you could serve as a reviewer or a panelist, you learn an enormous amount about the peer review process uh, taking, uh, doing that. Okay, so now uh, back to um, um, my life at Fullerton. So Cal State Fullerton is a large comprehensive university, part of the Cal State University system. It's a comprehensive university, so there's, we award bachelor's and master's degrees. So our campus is about 40,000 students. About 12% of the students are in the Natural Science and Mathematics College. And um, that, uh, the college uh, has a long history of um, engaging students in research, which is very good for, and that's something you might look for as you join a, a system, depending upon um, how you like to spend your time. If there's a, been a history of uh, uh, valuing undergraduate research, it, you know, it make your job easier. Um, so I came from off of a postdoc at Michigan State. We were doing uh, plant biochemistry and some microbial systems. I chose a nice niche that involved microbial systems where I could still have a good impact on the field uh, with respect to the, the, the research I was able to produce, but it wouldn't, but I had to calibrate it so it could be a project that I could uh, break, subdivide into projects that undergraduates could realistically participate in and collect data in, um, and emphasizing teamwork among the students. So um, I had a, a very large lab that I would have involved teams of undergraduates that have individual projects, but because one, one uh, research strand would be more than, say, so you have to adjust to what a full-time graduate student or a postdoc would do, you need to utilize, or I found it effective to utilize teamwork approaches to get students uh, um, um, on uh, to work productively together. An another thing that we've, we've done at Fullerton and, and other campuses do this is to really have integrate teaching and research in courses. So then you can scale your research, be able to train students and you know with the skills they need, but also uh, because you can't create more time and if you want, and you can't just lock yourself in the lab and work with two students, but I think the scaling of research that can happen in a class and where students can then go to individual research projects um, is, is a pretty good strategy. So um, I'm big in getting students to participate in going to meetings uh, as co-authors, and uh, they presented it. I, I think it really, you want to really engage the students because their efforts, um, their value to the, they if they know that they're appreciated and you're really trying to get them into the research enterprise, that you know makes for a very dynamic and motivating environment. I, I think I'll stop there. Joe, would you like to go next? Sure. So 20 years ago, I struggled with what I wanted to do. I had authors at Duke Medical School, at Wake Forest Medical School, a physician at NIH, and then this little undergraduate university in northwestern Minnesota, um, Minnesota State University, Moorhead. It, it 8,000 students, all undergrads, mostly first generation. Um, and I, I chose that against my postdoc advisor's approval, in fact, he, was, he pretty much said I was leaving science at the time. He's since changed his mind, but because it was a family decision, you know, I had, a, uh, my family was from that part of the country. My wife was more than interested in, in not, or she wanted to go home. She didn't want to live in, in some of these other areas, even though we had a good time postdocing at Vanderbilt. And so I started that life, and it took me a year or two before I finally decided that that was the role for me, and it turned out to be the exact right choice even though it wasn't intent, it wasn't what my career plans were. That wasn't what my big shot was. So there for there for 16 years I taught five to, uh, four or five classes each semester. I had undergraduate research students. I had a lab that had eight to 12 students each semester and in the summer I've been fortunate to, well, we've all are fortunate to write more grants than we get funded, but I have been funded for about two and a half million dollars with the grants from NSF and NIH and other places for research, some for teaching. Um, and then uh, four years ago, I was asked to come to the University of San Diego and, and provide some leadership and help grow their biochemistry program. And this is a very different place, but it's a, a fantastic institution. So I've been both at a public undergraduate school and a private undergraduate school. And uh, here there's a lower teaching load. It's two or three courses a semester. 
Um, and there's a higher level of expectation for research. You're expected to get grants or be very competitive at getting grants. You're expected to publish one paper every year and a half or so as a biochemist and still have excellent teaching. So I still have, you know, 9, 10, 11 students in, in my lab. I teach biochemistry. I teach non-majors. I, I get to teach a class in the science of cooking. So you still get to do a wide variety of things. And I think the best thing about a job like this is every day is different. I mean, one day if your lab just it's dying, you know, you got a bad review from the NSF. Sorry, Chris. Yeah. Um, uh, if, and, and things aren't working, then you turn around, you go to class, and things just jive. There, the, the students click. You know, they're understanding stuff. Or on another day, we just hating. You another day of grading, you put it aside. You go in the lab, you work with your research students, and you make something happen. Um, you know, we'll not talk about committee work because that's just a requirement no matter where you go. But it, it, the variety is, is fantastic. I don't even call it work. I mean, I need to get paid so I can afford to live, but honestly, I, I think I would do this job for free. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to give Andre a chance to answer, but before, if, if anybody has any questions based on what the, what the panelists have told us or what Andre is getting ready to tell us, uh, you can type those questions into the chat box. We have disabled. Uh, speaking for all the participants so it doesn't get uh, too overwhelming for our panelists. But please go ahead and start typing your questions into the chat box on the lower left of your screen. And now, Andre, last but not least, would you like to go ahead and answer our first question? All right. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Um, so I'll actually give this a take from a typical day at work at a primary undergrad institution. For me, you get, I get there, and the first thing, I review my lesson plan for the day just to make sure everything is on point because these institutions are very keen on teaching and they want you to teach well. So review my lesson plan ensures that that day will get to a good start. Now the second thing is that you are you are able to do research at a primary undergraduate institution. You are actually required to do research at most of these institutions now. So I once my lesson plan is set and I know it's good I head up to the lab and I start working with students. Then from there it's on to class. And once you get to class, you have interaction with all the students there. And from that moment on for the rest of the day, you'll be interacting with your students. Because the students have questions about classes they're taking, about career choices. So you're pretty much on the go from you step foot in the door. And you are, you are expected to be on committees. So you are going to university-wide committees. So you are participating in committees. So you have a lot of time that you have to devote to other things. But you must get your research done, and you must ensure that your teaching is on point. And I'll stop there and see, and so we can get to the questions. Mm -hmm. Great. We haven't had any questions yet, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next topic, which is, oh, we do have a question from Kelsey. Uh, Kelsey has a question for Andre. Uh, she asked if Andre, if you could speak about your experience and the value of doing a research and scientific teaching postdoc through the Arasta program. All right, so I, 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 I forgive me for not mentioning my Arasta connection in the beginning, but to be able to donate thirty percent of your research, your postdoc time to teaching, is huge because I find it like vital to my applications for jobs at any institution to have a teaching background. So being able to teach kind of gave me an edge up, and you're asked to provide me that opportunity to be able to teach. And Dr. Margaret Carroll is here, who was my teaching mentor as an Arachna fellow. So it's good to hear Dr. Carroll again. But I would say that just being in a program that values teaching was vital. And you have to get your research done as a postdoc also. Whether you decide to go to a primary or other institution or you decided to go to a research in one institution, being able to teach effectively can never be a bad thing. So I would always recommend a postdoctoral program where you have access to teaching. Thanks, Andre. Uh, Cynthia, I see your question, and we are actually going to address that uh, here in just a little bit. So I'm going to keep your question and make sure the panelists actually answer it, but we will get to that in just a few minutes. Uh, so we're going to move on to the to the second portion, which is how to prepare for a career as a PUI faculty member. And my first question is, how do you recommend graduate students and postdocs prepare for a career as a PUI faculty member? Some of you have already answered this through through your answers to your first question. So if you'd like to add anything at this point, uh, please feel free. 
Well, you know, having done this at both a state public uh, teaching primarily institution and one that's more balanced, um, you do have to have both the research, and this kind of hits one of the other questions. If you don't have a research program that's tractable at an undergraduate institution, you're not going to be a competitive application applicant. So, you, so you still have to uh, focus on the teaching as well, and that's hard to do uh, depending on when you're at. I know that. I think what helped me is I had got hold of some Howard Hughes Medical Institute. They talked about a day in the life of teaching undergrads, and from there I was able to find what what some of the logo or the 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 catchphrases were of the day. And now that's much more advanced than that. So if you want to be involved in, in, in being competitive in an undergraduate institution, learning about the teaching is actually really important. Um, the Mayo Clinic has a, a graduate and postdoc group that's try to bring up things like Fogel or case-based research or cures, and they bring in speakers to do video conference to teach them about this. And so by just becoming familiar with ways of teaching and that you can include in your statements and your teaching statement jumps way ahead. I know that we, we look at both research and, and that teaching. And you may not have done a lot of teaching experience, but just knowing that you're aware when you go to video, when you go to conferences, that you've gone to the education sections that you can speak to. Well, I haven't done a lot of Fogel, but I've learned about this and I've read this and I would really like to try it in my first class. Saying things like that tell us that you're aware of the profession of teaching, even if you haven't done a lot. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, and I would add in that at the community college, almost no one will get hired for a full-time position if they haven't taught um, as an adjunct. Um, and that's one of those things that you may or may not realize that you can do. Um, you can get a job as an adjunct, which means a part-time um, teaching position. And there are several people here at our community college who are doing it without the knowledge of their current research advisors. I, I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say that. And that because the community colleges hire especially adjuncts to teach at night and on the weekends, it's possible to do it without approval of your advisor. It's better, of course, if your advisor is interested and helpful in approving of that process. But even if not, it would be another way to do it if you can't um, do it officially. I will tell you that I hire, uh, as uh, the uh, person in charge of that right now, incoming chair, I hire postdocs as adjuncts now and then if they're interested in this and kind of mentor them through that. And oftentimes we don't look to talk to their postdoc advisor because we know that that's probably not a popular topic. But we make sure we arrange it on times so that it's, it's convenient for them and doesn't hurt their career. Yeah, I'd just like to echo my colleagues. I agree that you need the research and teaching. I think. You know, 25 years ago, probably if you TA'd a lab TA for a course as a grad student, oh, okay, yeah, you're enthusiastic about teaching. Now it's, you know, you need a more experience. If you've taught a class, now again, it's probably not been a major endeavor during your, your graduate and postdoc careers, but if you've taught a class beyond being a TA, that can be very valuable. And I would agree learning more about the, the whole process of, of uh, science education. Um, you know, a lot more resources now for that. There's a a number of uh, the research coordination networks for undergraduate biology education, um, RCNUBE, um, easy to find on the NSF website. Those are, are great uh, networks to be involved in that you can engage more in uh, learning about um, teaching um, and um, you know the problem-based learning, inquiry-based teaching, and uh, certainly the professional societies you want to um, you know uh, get in get involved in the education uh, areas of, of education. The other thing about the research project, you really, you really want to um, design your projects carefully so that you're really, um, you know, develop something that has a reason. Chris, we can't hear you when you yeah. turn away. Yeah, sorry. But you want to try to develop your projects, and I've said before, with sort of a reasonable scope uh, that you can really, uh, that undergrads and perhaps master's degree students can collect and analyze data. So if, you're, if your research is, you know, you need to calibrate it and adjust it for your environment. That's not to say you can't do competitive science and, and, and uh, make contributions to the field, but, you know, you have to keep in mind um, the students doing the work uh, and, and their development in education. Yes, I'd like to even um, add to that, that especially if you're thinking about um, applying to a PUI or a community college, because some, yeah, 
as Tamara said, some of the community colleges, they certainly incorporate the idea of trying to give the, um, the community college students that are involved in STEM that some, some interest in research and research training. Uh, if you're thinking about trying to talk about that when you're going for an interview or when you're applying, uh, you might want to check out the PUI in the community college. Like if you've been doing uh, mammalian research, you're working with rats, you're working with rice, uh, mice, rabbits, whatever you might be working with, do they have an animal facility there? You might want to think about somehow fine-tuning the research that you would like to do on that campus with the facilities that they have. So if you want to do cell culture, that's probably okay, microbial. Um, a research that would be good, C. elegans, these are all things that, you know, that probably PUIs and community colleges might be interested in trying to say, yes, uh, wow, you could bring this to our institution, you can start a good research project here. If it's something very high-end, they don't have the instrumentation to do the research that you want to do, they don't have the animal facility, sometimes you have to, like, think about that before you actually send out the application to that institution because they turn around and say, well, you know, th these people can't, the type of research that they do, we can't do here. And that might be a turn off for them if they're, um, you know, if they're reviewing your application. So you do want to, you know, think about the scope of where you're, where you're applying to and, you know, investigate, you know, check out on the web page, find out, you know, what's going on in that institution, what kind of research are they already doing there. Um, and and what kind of facilities that they already have before you actually uh, send in your application uh, and your cover letter about what kind of research you want to do on their campus. So it's just something else to consider. But I, I think pretty much a lot of the PUIs and the community colleges are moving more so towards wanting to hire people that do have uh, an active research project that they can bring to the campus. Certainly our institution is, Joe's institution is, um, and, and many of the community colleges, even T Tamara said that, you know, we certainly want to start keep moving forward and giving the undergraduate students an opportunity to consider research. If they're science majors, we want them to go forward. We want to know, want them to know what they're getting into. Yeah, I de they added that into the job description for mine that you are supposed to be doing undergraduate research. Too. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would emphasize, too, that it would be good if you um, – the best preparation I had as a, a postdoc and a grad student was working with undergrads in the lab. And, and that's part of, partly what motivated me to seek out a position that integrated teaching and, you know, had teaching and research for, for the reasons Joe explained about, you know, it can be a great career uh, to, to, to do both. And so really um, working with them, seeing how they think, and, and uh, that – it, and it was partly as part of an REU program that Michigan State had that I was a mentor for some of them. It really was great preparation. The other thing that's important to maintain is collaborative ties. I mean, mm -hmm. institution externally with R01, um, I think that that, uh, that that can certainly keep you um, very current, and, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of um, – researchers at larger institutions that are interested in those kinds of collaborations. It can be mutually beneficial uh, for the students, for the faculty. Yeah, I, I will agree with that, just in general. Like, you must have some kind of collaboration existing, because PUI want to have their students work with research on institutions, because it's helpful to them a lot of times. So if you can develop a program where you collaborate with, for example, a research on institution close to your community, where your students are able to go there at least weekends or in the summertime to get some research done, those will be very attractive going into your PUI job. Yeah, I agree. We just did a, a, a two hires in the last two years, and then a couple of them, they needed a high-end NMR, or like myself, where, where we're at now, we don't have a, a, you know, a mouse facility for nude mice. But when putting in, in, in an application that I already have a partner that I'm willing to send uh, uh, samples with, uh, tells me that you've already thought it through, and, and again, you're tractable, but it's not just the research work. I'll be honest with you, when we look at this, we look at is the research going to be fundable, will it be publishable, can it be tractable, can you do something, you know, with the odd schedules that the undergrads have. If you have something that's the only experiment you can do takes 12 hours each day, well, that you haven't thought that through yet, but at the same time, we want to see from the teaching statement that you really thought about teaching, because I can tell you, you know, at the University of San Diego, which is very different than in Minnesota State Morning, we were hoping we'd get two or three good candidates there. And here at University of San Diego, because it's Southern California, 
we'll get 150 applicants, and some of them are just freaking Nobel Prize laureate type postdocs and grad students, and but their teaching is just not there. So it has to be a balance, and that's the best thing I can tell you to to do it as a as a balance. And if teaching is more important at that university, like maybe TAMS or some of the others are then make sure you put more effort into that as well and not just research. Giving me something that works for Harvard for a research uh, description will turn me off in a heartbeat because you haven't thought about it. Right. Absolutely. And it's all about the fit, really. And so um, and, and uh, you would want, it, when possible and, and you know, c uh, correct, if, the, if your research can translate into a, a course, uh, that can serve a lot more students and have a bigger impact. So look for those research that can be, that's not possible for every part of your research project, but some that can be translated into a classroom or for outreach. Those are the kind of uh, projects that are, are attractive for NSF as well when they look at um, um, proposals for RUIs, from RUIs uh, campuses. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to move al along to developing compelling application materials now. And I'm going to go back to Cynthia's question, which was, uh, which I think fits really well with this topic. Cynthia asked, what do search committees at, at these institutions look for in a potential job candidate? And how can she be a competitive, how can anyone be a competitive candidate for these positions? Well, I guess uh, I maybe go first, and I have to reiterate, we, we certainly are expecting people with uh, recent PhDs to, you know, have, you know, a number of publications that they've had from their graduate program and their postdoc. So we're looking for people who have had a successful graduate degree and postdoc experience that has had some publications. And um, we're looking for an application that's going to be able to, um, to talk about the research that they did and how that could translate into our institution as a PUI. So we want that. We certainly want some sort of teaching experience. I mean, just being a TA, a teaching fellow, sometimes is not enough unless you can write a teaching statement that is convincing that you were um, that you were interested in in the uh, the science of the teaching and and how you interacted with students, particularly undergraduate students. Certainly, teaching grad students is not the same as teaching undergraduate students. And uh, just like Tamara, who's at an MSI, um, and I'm at an MSI, you know, we're also interested whether or not, you know, you've taught um, a diverse group of students before. Um, that might be interesting to us. Where have you toured? Where have you come, you know, come from? And and uh, what kind of interactions with undergraduates have you had? So, you know, we certainly are interested in your teaching statement. Okay, besides your research statement. And the research statement, as I said, should be geared towards how you're going to change your, um, your R01 graduate research, postdoc research experience, how you're going to utilize that in our institution. If you haven't taken the time to look up our institution and see how, it, how your research can translate into our campus, you know, then we're not going to be too interested in doing any kind of follow-up with you. But if you look like you have some good ideas, if it looks like you've had some teaching experience, and it is kind of sad to say that if you're a postdoc, maybe sneak out on a Saturday morning and teach a class, you know, at, at, as, an, as an adjunct. I mean, we almost hate to say that because we never would tell the um, – the postdoc mentors that um, PIs that they're doing that, but I mean sometimes it's nice to know. It's comforting for us to know that you've actually handled a class, you've made up the test, you've turned in the grades, you understand what the system is to actually um, do that. So you know, having just even a three-hour class once a week, if you were doing that, you could certainly sneak in some time at night or on the weekend to try to get an adjunct job. And in many areas, adjunct jobs are easy to come by. You know, for experienced, uh, young, uh, energetic postdocs, I think that sometimes we're very happy to bring these young people into our classrooms as adjuncts to see what they can do. And, you know, then you get letters of, you know, you can get a letter of recommendation then even from wherever you did do that adjunct job. You can maybe have the chair, you know, be a reference, and that might be somebody that we might be interested in speaking to and following up with. So I would say those things are kind of important if you, if you want your application to stand out and uh, hope for an interview um, opportunity at a PUI or community college. I think those are important things that you have to look at. 
So in addition to what Dr. Carroll, in addition to what Dr. Carroll just said, right now we are reviewing applications for positions in our department at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I think the thing I come across is that the cover letters are very poorly written. Now that's how we judge you. If you made a cover letter for Medgarvis College, try to erase that when you're applying for a job at SDU. So there are a lot of spelling errors. There are a lot of just like things that don't fit. Make sure that's well written. That's a representation of you. And your research statement will most likely be optional for a lot of PUIs. But it's really not. Because as Dr. Carroll just said and Joe said earlier, we are trying to see if your research can gain traction at a primarily undergrad institution. Are you able to engage students to, com to complete research projects or even experiments during the day or a week, not 12 hours a day because they don't have that kind of time? So we are very interested in that. And you're teaching, you have to gain teaching experience. I mean, maximize the time you have as a postdoc. If you can't get into an Iraqi program, then as Dr. Carroll said, you, mo you may have to just sneak out and teach a class on a Saturday morning or maybe in the evenings. And Iraq is not the only program out there that has a teaching focus, but I'm not 100% sure what some of the others are, but if you're interested in finding out more, more about Iraq programs, feel free to contact me or even Dr. Carroll, and we'll probably give you some ideas of Iraq programs that exist that you can apply to get some teaching experience while you're completing your full stop. I just have to add before anybody else speaks that uh, Dr. Wallace was a graduate of Medgar Evers College, okay, who eventually has now given back because he was an Arachta Fellow through the Rutgers programs that we have the relationship with, and very, very proud of him coming back, teaching in my cell biology class. I have to give him some kadoos, and uh, very happy now that he's an assistant professor and starting his own career. So, I mean, this is, this is actually very wonderful. So I'd just like to say that that was just a turnaround in case people haven't caught the connection between Dr. Wallace and myself, that I was his uh, teaching mentor in uh, the Iraqta program. So very, very happy how things have worked out from him being a graduate of Medgar and now actually uh, uh, giving back to other students over at Fairleigh Dickinson. So very happy about that. So I'm sorry to interrupt there. So give somebody no, that's, that's fine, Margaret. I think it's good to explain. <laughs> Uh, James, one of our participants, would like the panelists to comment on additional challenges faced by non-resident immigrants who apply for PUI positions. Well, I, I think, you know, again, making sure that you're clear to, to, to be there. But everything we look, we don't care so much where you're from unless it's coming from soft money. So it really comes down to the same thing. Do you have research that's trackable? Are you experiencing research? You know, and I, I do want to add that to be a good competitive applicant, especially if you're, okay, I can address a big part of that. When you're looking at a, a non-U.S. applicant, it isn't so much that you're not from the U.S., but are you aware of the kind of educational experiences that these students have? It's very different in the British system or in, in, in uh, you know, the Pacific Rim or, or wherever you're from. So do they, do they understand where these kids are coming from? Do they understand they're, they're coming in? They're not, they have to do, a lot of humanities courses. They can't just take a technical kind of coursework and then and then work in the lab. So making sure that you're aware or communicating that you know what it is that that university expects of you and the kind of students that you can relate to that. Um, just being from another country actually is kind of an interesting aspect and helps departments who are looking for diversity in their departments. Mm -hmm. But again, knowing that you can relate and you can fit in and you can teach at the right level because you know an undergraduate education in other countries can be very different. The other thing I wanted to say, though, is you can still get teaching experience even if you're not going as a adjunct somewhere. You can talk to folks at your own institution and say, hey, can I sit in in class? Can I do two or three hours of your class? And don't forget the lab. Teaching part of the lab is a big part of what helps people know that you're ready to do this. So you don't have to do a whole section. Say, can I come in? Can you show me how you develop a, a syllabus advising students? Can I sit in on a couple of your classes? Can I give a couple of lectures? I think that will help jump people up quite a bit. And it doesn't have to be your postdoc advisor, some of your department, somebody in a neighboring department. And the other thing I want to say for all students, international or not, is you're not just having biochemists look at this. You're going to have organic chemists. You're going to have cell biologists. You're going to have environmental biologists. And if you speak in your research statement 
to such a fine-tuned level that nobody gets it, you're not going to get excitement across the board. It's kind of hard to get selected. And the same thing with your teaching side of things. If you say, okay, I want to teach this upper division class that's the cream that everybody wants to teach, and then I'll teach a specialty class in 900 megahertz NMR of living mice that have been injected with interferon, you're never going to get to offer that okay. class. You need to find whether you're an international faculty or if you're uh, someone from this country and show them that you can be a utility infielder. You can teach in the lower level class. You can teach non-majors classes. You can teach labs in areas outside of your comfort zone. I had to teach as a biochemist, as what I think my current department would call a biologist biochemist. I had to teach organic chemistry lab. I had to teach general chemistry lab. I teach non-chemistry labs, all stuff I haven't seen since I was their age. But being able to do that makes you a much more attractive candidate mm -hmm. because that means I know, as, as somebody who has to set up a schedule, I can put you into a hole here or there in a schedule. And so if you haven't had those, then take some graduate classes in something that's outside of your major that's not just for your research. That will help in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go on to our last section. We, we do have two questions waiting in the uh, Waiting and waiting, and I'm going to leave those to the last five minutes or so. So, if any of our participants have questions, get those in now because we'll we'll keep the last like five or ten minutes for participant questions. But let's go on to our last section for the day, which is successfully interviewing. Sorry, successfully interviewing for positions. Uh, panelists, can you describe what is the typical interview process is for faculty positions at your institution? So I'll go for that's it. probably one of the more recently. Right through this process. Um, yeah. At our place, um, there were about 100 applicants for my position, which I got a few years ago. Um, and then they selected from those about six for what they called the first round um, interview. And in that, I was uh, expected to give a teaching presentation. I was given the topic ahead of time. I had about 15 minutes to do like a sample of what my teaching would be like. Um, and then the committee had on it a dean who would be my dean, um, two biologists, because that's what the department that I was interviewing for, a chemist, a mathematician. They had staff members, so for us, they chose a lab manager. But there's a pretty prescribed set of people that needed to be on the committee, and there had to be people from outside your field as well as um, inside the field. Um, the very first question I was told ahead of time by a, a colleague who was interested in helping me get hired, he said, you've got to be able to talk about your teaching philosophy. It's the very first question. And we've had people freeze up um, who can't say anything. And they're, just, they're not going forward if they can't talk about teaching. Um, and then I was asked about um, experience and willingness to teach online. Um, and I think that's something you've got to be a little bit careful about. It's a little bit of a loaded question. Um, mm -hmm. You are. The administrator wants to hear one answer, and your fellow faculty, maybe not the same Ooh. answer. So perfect. I think you need to be able to kind of walk a fine line with the, the online question. Be, um, be flexible, but also don't be all on board with everything should be online, because then you scare your fellow faculty members. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're going to be asked about how you engage students. What would you do in problem situations? How do you support students? Um, you need to be familiar with the type of students that come into your institution. Um, speak about the values and mission of the institution that you're, require, or you're applying to. Like, for example, with the community college, um, there's a high value on the open access part of the institution, um, high values on retention and, and things like that, the kind of issues that your institution might be facing. Um, and then after the first interview, um, three of us were then sent a 10-question um, essay. We were basically asked to answer about a page for each question. And then um, we had to send that back in to the, the next committee, which consisted of the president and another dean. Um, and then that secondary interview, we were asked questions more sort of general and about the, the type of college and the um, the sort of bigger global questions that the, in, the administrators were interested in. Yeah, Would anybody else like to comment, or I can ask another question? I, I think uh, I think that 
some just to add a, a few things that pretty much summed it up. You got to be ready for a teaching um, demonstration, a research seminar, lots of meetings. So you want to really get some, be well rested and prepared and observant during the interview. That's really important. It's not like cramming for a test and you're exhausted. During the day. It'll stretch you because. A lot of places you'll meet with untenured faculty, and then you'll hear their views, and then you'll meet with the chair and the personnel uh, committee, uh, um, pers department personnel committee. Uh, you'll meet with the dean. They'll want some. Yeah, I would have in mind what your startup needs would be. It depends on the position, but be prepared for that. And you really need to be prepared, as has already been been stated, uh, for the kind of institution, the kind of students there. Um, it's not, you know. It, uh, these places all have web, you, you can get to the mission of the college and the university. We've had sometimes fantastic candidates who were clearly thinking that it was UC Fullerton or something. They weren't, they were very confused about uh, what the position was. And even though they had lights out research, they really, it was clear they were not a good fit um, work with our students and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, be productive uh, in that environment. So yeah, uh, get some rest and be prepared. I just want to like mention real quick the online interviews because we do do interviews online for her job position, at least up, up front. If you're not close by, we are going to interview online. So be ready for either a phone interview or a Skype interview. So come prepared. Get rid of background noises. Just make sure you are ready to go. So that, that option is there also. We, had, we did Skype interviews just last year, or actually this last semester, one was outside in a park and it started to rain on it, and the other one, he was outside in the parking lot and cars were going by and it was hard to at this oh my time, God. you know, and, and these are good candidates up to that point, so it made us question, are they really serious about this, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's good for a Skype, and, and I'm, I'm a bad example of how I'm hunting. <laughs> It's good to get this in an interview, but it's good to, to have your colleagues or friends say, how do I look on Skype? Am I looking at the right place? Because there's some people that are very practiced at it. They'd have a huge advantage just in that visual, and so you want to make sure you're, you know, you're not, um, you know, a little practice would go a long way there. Yeah. And I would give one last tiny little advice. When you do give a teaching seminar, you want to try to show off your chops, how to in interact with the students. This is a real dangerous zone because the students, they're sitting there, their faculty, their teachers are in there. They don't want to make a mistake and look dumb, and you haven't developed a rapport with them. So asking for questions, you're going to get silenced. But instead you say, it, do some different active things where they don't have to raise their hand and speak out loud. You can say, all right, let's look at this problem. There's three options here, A, B, or C. Who votes for A? Who votes for B? Who votes for C? Talk to your partners and do those kind of small little things, and it shows that you know how to engage people, but you're not going to go out there and say, all right, who thinks this is important? Because then yeah. you're stuck. Yeah. And <laughs> even if you're really good at that, you're not going to answer. I mean, you don't have their grades in their pocket. So it's, 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 a, it's good to try to get involved in that thing when you're doing the on-site interview, but it, you know, be very careful and practiced on it. Great, thanks. Um, we have a few questions from our participants, so I'd like to get to those. And then um, we'll finish up right about 2.30, and any of the panelists who can stay for an extra five or ten minutes to take any additional questions from the audience, that would be great. If you can't, no problem. Any of our participants who would like to stay and, and ask questions, uh, you can do so after 2.30. So we have two questions in the, in the log right now. Ender asks, how do PUIs evaluate teaching effectiveness for career advancement and promotion? Is it just based on student evaluations, or are there other factors? Well, there's definitely other factors, and that's a good question to ask during your interview. If it's only on student opinion forms, that may not be the place for you, okay? So, so certainly a component is of that. I mean, and, and I think that there's, they've gotten better, I think. It's not just a popularity um, rate my professor kind of uh, thing. Um, so a component will be of that, but that really isn't, um, hopefully your, your courses will be uh, visited by some of your colleagues, you'll have a, a teaching mentor, maybe a research mentor as well, so you really like to look at the content, okay, so uh, most places as you go through, you, know, you might have an annual portfolio that you turn in, and so teaching, uh, it, it shouldn't just be based on, on that, because, uh, you know, given STEM and, you know, biochemistry, these are difficult topics, so um, I think that you should be evaluated on several aspects of teaching and not just, uh, you know, opinion forms. 
We do peer evaluation, too. So not only do the students get an opportunity to so-called fill out the evaluation forms of the course and the professor, but um, the faculty is expected to um, take new hires and, and at least once a semester that we would stay in for full class time and um, offer an evaluation. And especially the first year that, you know, the first year that the student, that the uh, faculty is actually being hired, a lot of times these peer evaluations are really there more to help the faculty, you know, and offer some maybe expert advice about how they could possibly even improve their teaching or handling the class or the topic. So that's, you know, I consider that to almost be not only an evaluation, but it's also a, a faculty to faculty mentoring type of thing, especially for new hires. So we certainly do that, and we put a lot of emphasis on um, that evaluation, because every semester would be a different faculty member who would be evaluating the teaching of that new instructor. And so um, I, I feel that, that that's been helpful to a lot of our new hires. I'd be interesting since. Uh, Dr. Wallace, Andre, you're right in the middle of this. You're in your first year, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. So actually, so from my interviews and from talking to the dean and everyone, what why they why they're interested in for promotion? It's pretty simple. Student evaluations do matter because apparently the person's job who I took over had very poor student evaluations, and essentially that kind of chased them out the door. Now, that's not the only factor, but they do weigh university service, like what, how many committees are you serving on? Are you going to be there to advise athletes on how to take classes throughout the semester since they have a Division I athletic program? Like how can they complete their, their studies in four years or four and a half years? Like can you develop courses? Can you develop new courses to appeal to students who are coming in? or to students who want to go to a college that have a course basically on, for example, cancer genetics. So what, what are you bringing to the table in terms of developing the university to take it to the new level? And your research, like how involved can you get students in your research? Are they going to be able to get, get publications from your research? So those are all factors that will weigh in on your promotion. Thanks. Andre and everyone else. Um, so our next participant question, how much do you expect new faculty members to deviate research from their postdoc work? Is this a concern for securing funding for um, NSF PUI grants? That, you know, that's a good question. That, that is somewhat dis Chris, can you get closer to, the, uh, to your phone, please? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little hard to hear you. Okay, I'll do, I'll get really close. Um, so, is it that sort of depends on the discipline a little bit? Um, that there's different practices really across chem and biochem about how close you are to your mentor or postdoc mentor. Um, I think it's it's wise to have um, some independence there. It will help, I think, with funding. Um, um, I've sort of developed some independent. It took it takes a bit longer to develop independent projects. Um, because I decided to not go into direct competition with my postdoc mentor, uh, but then go into the less studied but still very important microbial systems and the biosynthetic pathway I studied. So um, it was, you have to have some expertise in it, obviously, to be successful and get preliminary results. But I think a, a blend of, you know, obviously what you've learned has helped you and, and carry on. But again, at that point, that varies with the, the sub-discipline to think about how far away from that, that research you are. Great. Okay. Um, so another question. So Drew asked, what is the typical range for startup package funding at a PUI? And Joe did start answering his question in the chat box, and Joe said that ranges a lot based on schools. A mostly teaching PUI will have a four to ten thousand dollars for startup, while the more high-end schools will go from a hundred thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand, spread over two to three years. Would anybody like to add anything on to, to Joe's thought? That, that pretty much nails it. it. They vary quite a bit, yeah, and that's pretty yeah. much the range that I've seen. And there'll My be no first starting. job, I had a thousand dollars, and I had to buy a laptop with it. When I came yeah. here, I had one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I had some. Go ahead. So it's just that some schools will tell you what they'll buy for you up front. So a lot of times you may not be be able to get money 
from support startup, but if you have an idea of what you need, then you can secure those materials before you get there. So that's, that option is out there also. That, that's a good idea. So you should be prepared at the interview with questions about what your wish list would be, what your what your needs are, uh, shared use of shared equipment. Be aware that you can sometimes buy used equipment, you know, that will work great, and that will stretch your budget quite a bit. Um, and so also be clear with the institution that um, – that your startup money is for startup and not for, oh, well, we'll have to renovate your lab space and that will be half of your startup. You know, make that clear that the lab should be ready to go. Um, but at the same time, if, even if your space is, say, not ideal and that they'll, they'll make amends later, you really need to get started right away and don't, don't wait for an ideal, perfect condition. Well, I can't start my research yet because I'm going to get this other room that the, someone promised me. You've you got to hit the ground running and really start it. And I would be careful in getting advice, who you get advice from when you're when you're uh, negotiating, because how you negotiate for startups and other uh, things like time off and teaching from an R1 institution can drive you out. I I've, I've seen people get um, an offer revoked because they were they were arguing as if they were an R1. I need more money. I want less time teaching. It was clear they weren't set, and so they they, they actually lost their offer. Mm -hmm. so be careful on who you listen to. Yep. Great. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to say a few final words. And for those of you uh, participants and panelists who need to leave because it's close to 2.30, feel free to do so after I uh, say a last few words. If you can stay, uh, we'll, I'll keep this going for about 5 or 10 minutes past the 2.30 time. Um, so thank you to anyone who could stay. We do have a few questions from participants already in the queue. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our five panelists for coming, uh, Dr. Carroll, Dr. Manns, Dr. Meyer, Dr. Provost, and Dr. Wallace. I really appreciate you giving over an hour of your time today to talk to the participants and to uh, volunteer through this webinar. We really appreciate your support. I'd also like to thank all of our participants for coming. I hope this was a helpful uh, webinar for you. And once you either X out of the webinar or I close it after we completely end all the questions, you will be sent to a survey. It's very brief. It's about five minutes, but it will really help us improve future webinars on this topic and other topics. For those of you who are not ASCMB members, uh, if you do go and fill out the survey, you will receive a membership discount code at the end for $10 off new graduate student membership and $20 off new associate or postdoc membership. We'd still love to hear from our ASCMB members uh, about how, the, how, how helpful this webinar was for you because we would like to continue offering helpful and useful webinars. Um, I, did, I want to end on one final note. I'm going to request any of our panelists, if you have any resources, slide decks, um, online articles, PDFs of articles you think will be helpful to our participants, uh, I'm going to send you an email after this. But if you could send those to me, I'd love to share them with our participants. So participants, I'll put all of those together into a downloadable PDF that will be accessible on the ASDNB webinar website after probably next week. Um, it, a, a recording of this webinar will also be available on the ASDNB webinar page and on YouTube. Uh, so you can access both that resource document and the recording on the website as well. And, uh, you can also uh, register for some of our upcoming webinars as well. So again, thank you to our panelists and to our participants for taking the time uh, to, to lead this webinar today. So any of you who need to go ahead and go, please fill out that survey, um, but feel free to leave now. And I'm going to go ahead and keep this on and continue asking questions as they come through the chat box. So for those of our panelists who can stay, Valerie would like to know if it's possible to jump into a straight teaching position without having done a postdoc. Uh, in, in the chat box, uh, Tam was able to answer, and she said yes, at a community college, uh, Tam had a postdoc, but many of her colleagues do not. Would anybody like to add on to Tam's uh, response? Well, I don't know. My guess would be it, it does depend where across the country you're talking about. I mean, I'm over in the metropolitan New York area. I think all the community colleges in my area would expect that um, a faculty member should have done at least one postdoc, two years worth minimum, to even consider, um, I guess, uh, in a community college setting here or certainly a PUI setting. Even for a PUI, we actually had hired a, a couple of years ago a, um, 
a person who only was in uh, a two-year postdoc, but but she was really phenomenal. She gave a great interview. She seemed like a great role model for the students. She had uh, all the right answers to the questions, and we were hiring three people that time, so she actually uh, made the cut. We really liked her, and she only had two years of postdoc, and that was a little unusual for us, um, but again, she just seemed like a perfect fit, and we've been very happy with her. She's probably coming up for tenure now next year. So uh, I guess it is, you know, possible, um, you know, maybe some of the smaller colleges across the United States, they might actually still take people who only get a Ph.D. and have not done a postdoc. But I think that the trend in, um, in STEM is, is uh, different now, that they really expect people to have additional training beyond their Ph.D. Um, in the research field to um, be even better prepared to bring more to the table. Uh, when when you hire them now, and there, you know there are so many PhDs. Let's just be honest. We have a lot of PhDs, and you know we have a lot to pick from. So I guess you know for you to stand out, you almost have to have a little bit more than just that PhD degree. So I, I'd say at least you have to be involved in, in a postdoc. Whether I don't think I'd even would want somebody who's who's done like five or six postdocs. Certainly not at a PUI. I mean, you know, maybe we would want you to do one or possibly two postdocs, okay? Possibly two, but no more than that for a PUI, and I would think a community college. I don't know whether Tamara's still on, but, I mean, certainly that's the way I would feel. I would say that at places like Moorhead State, where we lived, that was, you know, damn near Canada, um, <laughs> we didn't get a lot of applicants, and so we did take a look at folks without it. I know folks in other places, more rural or in teaching almost only options, that, that, yeah. is, that is the case. But I think, Chris, I'd like to hear what, if you go to a place that where research is expected and there is some funding that they hope for you to do, what you would say from NSF, your experience is people getting grants without a postdoc as a PUI. I think the postdoc experience is pretty important. You want the right one, of course, that will really add value, and, and, you know, there might be some that, wouldn't be a good fit or a postdoc too long. I agree with what's been said, but like at, at Cal State Fullerton, almost all of our uh, applicants or people that were hired have, you know, fair amount of postdoc experience. In one case, he didn't because the area was more of a sort of a chemistry and engineering, and, and the lab he was in was sort of very comprehensive that way, and so it was less common. But even then, he had a he had another academic position before he came. So. Um, I think it just just gives you more um, tools to work with if you've been working at another. And, and again, you can stand out a bit more. So, so and 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 it's just very proud of our different postdoctoral um, fellowship programs. You know, they don't fund directly all postdocs, but certainly NSF grants do. So, it it is a really important experience. And I think there's now uh, postdoc mentoring plans and NSF funded grants and so it's not just the pair of hands at the bench that you're getting a lot of postdocs should be getting a lot of good valuable professional development mm -hmm. to teach mentor undergraduates and all these things would be really valuable for a PUI position. Yeah, I'd like to add too like even if you signed up say for a 3 year postdoc someplace, don't wait until the 3 year postdoc is over and then start looking for a job at a PUI. And a community college. You, certainly, in maybe your, you know, your last year of your postdoc, you should be aggressively already planning and looking ahead to try to see what's out there and what jobs are available. Maybe you could even try to do it um, after their, after you get your postdoc. There's n there's nothing wrong with actually applying for jobs if you're really looking to get into academia in a PUI or a community college. You could always be applying and seeing what's out there. In fact, you, even if you don't get the job, you still have your three-year postdoc in your pocket that you could finish off. But if somebody is, if you go on a search, um, if, you, if you meet a search committee and you get to go out and interview, not only do you get interview experience and you feel like it's not pressure because, you know, you got your three-year postdoc already, you know, in your pocket, but if something good develops, uh, you know, it's it's a career move, so you might just want to go ahead and see if you can get out of uh, that postdoc 
to actually move forward into an academic career if something good turns up. And you get, you know, you get interview experience. You could actually go on these interviews and find out what it's really like to be interviewed at a PUI. Each time you do it, you get better at it. So you should be doing all of that before you finish your postdoc. I, I have talked to a number of postdocs. They seem to just wait until it's over, and now suddenly they think a job is going to materialize. And um, sometimes that could just be a bad year to look for jobs. So that's something else to consider, too. When you're doing your postdoc, just kind of look at that as the transition period between your Ph.D. and actually getting a job in academia, especially if you're looking PUI and uh, community college level. So we have one other question from uh, – one more question from a participant. And then if we don't receive any others, I'll give the panelists time to say anything else they'd like to add. Uh, so our last question from a participant is, is there a minimum number of publications that are required? <laughs> At a PUI, uh, anybody else want to answer that first? Well, that's very discipline dependent, you know, and I'll say yeah. ideally that people don't bean count and that, they, you know, NSF likes to fund ideas, not incremental papers, right? So mm -hmm. having said that, but coming off a postdoc in biochemistry and, you know, Joe, you can jump in here and, as well, and others, that, I don't know, I, you'd probably want several, I mean, I don't know, um, coming out of a PhD. It depends on the impact and the size of the paper. Some, some of these papers are quite involved, you know, and, and, and uh, um, so, I don't know, during one's graduate and postdoc career, they might... Um, they might have six to eight publications. I, I mean, just I'm throwing. It would be a range, though, um, and it's it's not the one who has the most pubs that would necessarily be picked. And you probably don't want to be in a department like that because that's really not saying anything about the impact of the research and the, and the research training uh, for students and their opportunities. I mean, it's important to publish, and, and you know that's one of the products that that can allow you to uh, successfully apply for funding. But um, it's not the it wouldn't be the only criteria. And it's very discipline dependent. Some kind of research that, you know, can be very prolific. You know, that may not be the culture. You know, I think what we look for is, okay, did you get a postdoc in grad or did you get a publication or two in grad school? Did you get a couple pubs from your postdoc? Yeah. And if not, then why, right? Is that right. obvious? So if you feel that you didn't get the kind of publication rate you were hoping for, that needs to be addressed in your cover statement. You know, um, you might have been in a really risky project and it didn't work, or you were scooped, or your advisor lost their funding. There's lots. Mhm. Mm Joe, we lost your sound. Joe, we can't hear you anymore. Yeah. Joe, I we can't hear you anymore. He said, and what he followed up saying too. <laughs> <laughs> we did have two more questions come in from participants. So, uh, panelists, are you okay staying a few more minutes? Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So Jamie asks, uh, she, she joined a little bit late. I don't think we covered this question, though. Do you have any recommendations for who to ask for letters of recommendation? Well, you definitely, um, it, and, and again, this is the, they're more conspicuous by their absence, I think. Probably your PhD advisor, your postdoc advisor, if, if one of those are not on it, then it may require some explanation. I mean, things happen in terms of people's, you know, personality and dynamics, but those two would be very good. Uh, perhaps uh, another member of your committee or um, someone that might address other aspects of your career, like your teaching. You know, um, obviously the the uh, advisor would probably focus on the research, and probably the postdoc advisor as well. But you want to have, you know, just as we tell students when they're applying for graduate fellowships or different things, you probably would like some diverse letter of rec writers for you or, or references. You know, so. Um, certainly, um, people that know you the best and, and can comment on your work ethic and, and your talent and your ability, uh, but, but hopefully it wouldn't just be focused on research. I mean, sometimes um, evaluating um, um, files from, um, for a position at Fullerton, you'd see the postdoc advisor just address the research, even though we asked the, them to address other aspects of, of, pers of, of uh, a person's career, um, they sometimes won't. So it, it's a good idea to have someone that's probably familiar with other dimensions of your work um, that would be applicable to um, your career at a PUI. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll add while you're there. So that's, that brings up an important point. If you're a postdoc, you should 
get a postdoctoral committee. Just a committee to kind of help guide your career. It's not only good for graduate school, but get a postdoc committee. You may be able to ask one of those people for career advice and also for recommendation letters. And you should get a letter from someone who can basically attest to your teaching abilities. So make sure you do that. But I think that at a PUI and a community college, even though we're going to be very interested in what the different research mentors and associated people would say about your research skills, we probably want something about your experience with students. You know, even if you didn't have much teaching, you couldn't find somebody who can say your classroom teaching experience. Maybe you've mentored undergraduate students in um, in somebody's lab and maybe they can address how well you did that. I mean, it's something. You need something to deal with undergraduate students and preferably classroom um, experience, teaching experience. So I have to admit, I think that we would look for that. We'd feel more comfortable with that. You know, as Joe said, it all depends which institution it is, how many applicants you're competing against, you know, different areas such as uh, nice, warm San Diego. You know, there might be a lot of people who want to go there. Okay, people who are more um, research intensive people who really, you know, maybe shouldn't be looking at a PUI, but they want to go to San Diego. So, you know, they're going to be applying to the areas that they want to relocate to. And maybe if you're up in some cold area near Canada, maybe you wouldn't get as many applicants, and so therefore you could be uh, better off. But still, I would think that if you want to do a PUI in a community college, we feel very comfortable when we have some letter of reference from somebody who can attest to the fact that you have been with undergraduates, you can train them, you can teach them, you're successful, and that you like teaching. The worst thing that you can do if you're coming to a PUI or community college, don't give us the impression that you don't care much about students. I mean, if you care only about research and research intensive, we're going to pick that up and that you're not really interested in being with undergraduate students. And undergraduate students are different than graduate students, so you have to have a lot of patience. You have to really enjoy working with them. Um, they they don't come as skilled as maybe what you have wanted, and so therefore, like I said, you really have to uh, be involved in wanting to teach them all around, whether or not it's in the lab, or whether or not it's you know in a, in a lecture class. A few more questions that came in. So uh, one of the participants asked, some of my teaching experience is from guest lectures, not from formally leading the courses as an adjunct. How much does that count as teaching experience? So what I do, what I do when I give a guest lecture, is I have a, an evaluation sheet at the end of that lecture, just to kind of get an idea of what the students gained from that guest lecture. And I brought that with me to my interviews, just so they can see I've given this guest lecture, and this is how it reached or impacted the students. So you can use that in that avenue. Yeah, that would strengthen that type of situation for sure if you would be willing to bring with you an eva you know, a quick evaluation sheet when you give a guest lecture to undergraduates. Um, you know, if you if you make that sound like on your in if you make that sound on your application that you've taught undergraduates though, you know, we're gonna call you out on that on a search committee. We're gonna say, Well, what class was that? And then all of a sudden we'll find out, well, no, you were just a guest lecture and you came in and was a one time thing. You know, that's not the same thing as actually handling a course and handling a curriculum and giving exams. It's, it's not all of that. So, you know, never come across as, as being dishonest in saying that, oh, I've been an undergraduate teacher, okay, and then it really wasn't that. You just have to say, I've given numerous undergraduate um, lectures before, and the students have evaluated me. This should all be in your application. So you have to be honest. And I, I love what uh, Dr. Wallace said. In other words, think about, you know, think ahead. If you're giving an undergraduate lecture, bring bring a um, just a, an evaluation form and, and ask the students to fill it out, even if it's ten short, you know, bubbling the answers in. And you could bring that with you to the interview to show that actually you you can leave an impact on the students and that you're effective as uh, an instructor. That's a great idea. We kind of build in the assessment piece there, which is important to think about. And the other thing to do is, you know, uh, Joe, we lost you. Oh. 
Go ahead, go ahead and finish, Chris. I just wanted to let oh, Joe know that he's talking and we can't hear him. Oh, no. <laughs> Other activity, of course, is, you know, volunteer to be judges at science fairs and things. And the ASBNB has a meeting coming up that would be a great venue to, to do that. Because then you can talk about interacting, talking to undergrads about their work. So that, that can be an, uh, a, a good thing to do. Again, you don't want to overstate it, but it just shows your interest and motivation um, if, you, you know, uh, if you're doing those kinds of activities. Joe, still can't hear you. Still can't hear you, Joe. Nope, nope. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give all of our panelists, if you have anything else you'd like to add at the end here, um, go ahead and take, we have, we have probably about nine minutes left. So don't take too long, but we'd love to hear any last thoughts. Do you have any pieces of advice or anything you'd like to follow up on? Uh, why don't we start, we'll start in reverse order. Andre, would you like okay. to go first this time? So I will go first, and I'll say that when you create an application or portfolio for jobs at PUI, make sure that you represent yourself well. And while you're in your postdoc or in graduate school, whatever teaching you're doing, document it. Be friends with a course coordinator who selects the TAs because you want her or him to have an opportunity to write a reference letter for you, even if it's just to attest to the fact that a student we're, 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 we're making great demands to have you next semester as your TA, whatever it is, and keep those evaluation sheets from those students that you have. I kept all my evaluations from Penn State TA, and I put them in my application package. So make sure you keep those. And with that said, good luck. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Joe, I'll take you were unmuted now. Okay. You know, the best candidates get you excited on the phone interview, on a Skype interview, and when they visit. You get there and you go, God, I want this person, whoever he or she is, in my department. I think you're going to add to the department. So you got to look beyond, you know, your research and your teaching. You want to think how you're going to fit in with the colleagues. Are you going to excite the students? Are you going to be an engaged person? The last thing you want is somebody to go hole up in their lab or hole up in their office getting ready for classes and teaching. I, I think Mitch Melikowski, who was uh, the – one of the prior presidents of the Council of Undergraduate Research, talked about somebody being um, really confident, being almost arrogant in their abilities, but not to, not to the point where it was off-putting. They weren't afraid to try something new, and we knew that they were going to kind of really help our department move somewhere. Um, and, and that was exciting. They were friendly. They engaged students. And we knew that they had the rest of the stuff, and that's really what put somebody over the edge. You, you just... You just get that feeling that I, I want my office next to this person. Do you want to be that person? Thanks, Joe. Uh, Chris, would you like to add anything? I, I think I think Joe they had a great summary statement there. Uh, I, I think you do you, you want to to be that kind of candidate that you know they, they want you as a colleague, and and so you know what's in and, and I've got a number of uh, of um, handouts and things that that I. Think hopefully that might be helpful uh, that I'd be happy to share. Uh, feel free to email me here at NSF uh, C Meyer at NSF uh, .gov. Um, you know, essentially, you know what's in and out, collaborative ties, interdisciplinary elements of your research can be helpful. Uh, research with a long shelf life um, that um, can adapt to the times and scale. Um, if it can be translated to an, into the classroom, that's great. Um, you, what's out would be, you know, projects that could only involve a few students that have sort of boutique lab that would have very little impact. Uh, uh, research that doesn't overlap with skills that to be developed in the curriculum. Uh, if it's incremental, if it's overly dependent on, upon only one technique. And you really, for teaching, you really have to have demonstrate that desire to teach the center because that's really a big part of the job. And if you don't really like that and not passionate about it, there's a danger of a bad fit over time. Um, very strong communication skills, obviously. Um, core competency, if you've taken uh, courses, sometimes just being a postdoc in an area wouldn't enable you to teach it very well, uh, uh, a diverse number of classes. So people like colleagues that uh, be good citizens, that be adaptable, that could teach a little broader than their training. And I think these are things that, elements that my colleagues have touched upon as well. So, uh, happy to keep in touch and, and, and uh, network with you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Tam, would you like to add anything? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, if you're going to um, apply to a community college, one of the things that's really valued here is um, being resourceful, um, how to make do with very little. And if you show that you're going to be a good sport and you can figure out how to make a tissue culture thing out of a plastic bag, you know, whatever it is that you can figure out how to do, if you can bring in and say, I'm willing to tackle this, I can, I can figure this out, um, that's going to make you a valuable colleague. And also um, that flexibility in your teaching. That if you need me to teach anatomy, I, I can learn anatomy, sure. I, I know I've done I've done that before. You don't have to have done that before, but I've done a new new class before. I'm always teaching a new class or whatever. If somebody um, if you want to be the, the one that they choose, it's because you can do more than just what the job description is. Great. Margaret, any last comments? Boy, everyone has said such great things. It's tough to go last for this one. Um, maybe the only thing that I could add is that uh, I assume that our um, participants are, um, are you know, graduate students, maybe going for master's. They're in their doctoral program. I'm sure we have some postdocs as well. Mm -hmm. And especially if I could speak more to the, you know, the new graduate students, the ones who are just starting their graduate program, you know, think about trying to get into a PUI now. Yes, the road is, seems far ahead because we're not even, you know, near giving our defense for our PhD yet and we didn't think about the postdoc. But while you're in grad school, make connections, as you said, maybe try to even get involved interacting with undergraduates deliberately, okay, uh, either through teaching classes, giving seminars, talking to course coordinators, seeing whether or not you can give a guest, guest lecture, so that even before you have your postdoc, you start building up a repertoire of, of connections of people who can assess your teaching skills because you know when you get in the throes of a postdoc you suddenly may not be doing any kind of teaching at that point you might have a little more opportunity when you're still in your PhD program to maybe interact with people who can ultimately serve as good reference points um, for you and letters of reference for for your teaching skills and your teaching passion and desire and that yes this person always told me that they want wanted to, um, to go into academia, and they were particularly interested in teaching undergrads, and they interact well with, un inter uh, with undergrads. I think that would be good. And what else? Uh, I guess I could say try to de-stress. Um, enjoy the ride to your Ph.D., and enjoy the ride and everything that you're going to learn in your postdoc experience. And, you know, don't wait until everything is over before you say, okay, now I'm ready to be hired by somebody. You really have to, you know, plan this out, five-year plan, and what do I need to do to get into a PUI, get into that type of situation. That's what I want. What do I need to build up in my portfolio? Try to de-stress about it. It will happen. Okay, keep plugging at it, and uh, I wish everybody good luck. And also, too, um, Erica, I'll be um, sending um, my um, PowerPoint presentation with a little bit of information about my experience as a teaching mentor in the um, ARACTA program. So if any of the people Wonderful. are interested in taking a look at that, certainly that will be available at the ASBMB site. Wonderful. So I'd like to contribute that as well. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you to all of our panelists again and to our participants. Uh, one final reminder, when I close the webinar, you'll be taken to our survey site, and it would be great, uh, very helpful. I will read all of those responses. Very helpful to the ASCMB if you can complete that survey, including our panelists. I'd love to hear about uh, any recommendations you have for how we can improve the webinar series. Great. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again on a future ASCMB webinar. Very good. Thank you. All right, thanks.